The personalities that matter with Keith Vaz on Talking Points. Like a radio. Welcome back. This is Keith Vaz on Talking Points on Like a Radio. My special guest today is one of the most famous faces on British television and famous voices on British radio. Hardip Singh Kohli is a much respected and award winning broadcaster, comedian, writer, and chef. Hardip also sits on the board of the National Theatre of Scotland. He can be heard on BBC Radio 4, hosting shows such as Sketchtopia, Hardeep's Sunday Lunch and Pick of the Week. In 2008, he was featured in the Channel 5 series of Celebrity Big Brother. He's also regularly fronted programmes for BBC Radio 2, The World Service and the BBC Asian Network. He's been a presenter for Talk Radio, an interviewer on BBC's Sunday Morning Live, conducting interviews with the likes of Maureen Lipman, Nigel Benn and Lord Putman, amongst others, a regular of The Right Stuff, as well as a panellist and guest host. He's also an experienced comedian who tours the country and sells out at the Edinburgh Fringe. During the Scottish referendum campaign, he joined the Yes campaign. He joins me this morning from Glasgow in Scotland. Let's hear from our glass ceiling breaker, Hardeep Singh Kohli. Good morning, Hardeep. Good morning, Keith. I can hear a bit of drilling. Are you at the dentist's? No, I, no, it, it's second best. Now they're, they're building uh, upstairs. We had a flood uh, earlier this week, so I, wherever I go in my flat, I hear the sound of drilling. So if I'm at the dentist by the end of the week, that's uh, probably no great <laughs> surprise. Now, you, you've got... This amazingly strong Scottish accent, because anyone seeing you in your full flow with your turban will not expect a Scottish accent to come out of your mouth. But you were actually born in London. What made the family move to Glasgow? I think my dad wanted a different life. There was a lot of family, as you know, listen, anyone of colour knows that. There was family interference. And I think my dad wanted just to kind of bring up his family without kind of the oversight of uh, the rest of the family. Plus, England wouldn't recognise his qualifications. Only Scotland, uh, Dundee, of all places up in the north, uh, the north mm. offered him a, a traineeship as a teacher. So we came to Scotland and I'm so glad we did, you know. Mm. But you studied at a Roman Catholic school. You've had quite an yes. eclectic education. So I won't ask you to recite the Hail Mary with me, but <laughs> you, you, you went on to study law at Glasgow University, whose alma mater includes prime ministers, obviously Gordon Brown being the most prominent. Did you enjoy university life and did you start the comedian journey there or was it just all academic? Well, it's interesting. One remembers one's childhood differently from those you shared it with. And so for me, we can imagine being a Sikh, a child going to a Jesuit school. I'd like double guilt. I so, you know, <laughs> entire time not being sure which God was punishing me. But apparently my friends from school tell me it's sort of being funny started at school. I mean, it's the old cliche of you know, the weird, you know, the fat kid with the wonky turban and the NHS glasses used comedy to get out of situations. So it started there, but definitely law school sharpens your mind. You know yourself as a, in a kind of a legislator and a kind of public speaker and a politician that that sharpness brings with it wit as well as hopefully some degree of insight. So it sort of started then all the public speaking I had to do as a debater at school obviously debating university and having to sort of make cases and kind of moot court and stuff. That really just um, engendered comedy. And plus, we have a, you know, the West of Scotland comedy, Glaswegian comedy is very different from anywhere else in the world. Mm. But you switched. You could have been a lawyer. You could have been sitting in the Supreme Court as Mr. Justice Hardeep Singh Kohli, <laughs> the first <laughs> turban member of the Supreme Court. But you went off. You became a journalist. You decided to become a BBC graduate trainee. Talk about joining the establishment. What was responsible for that switch? Well, interestingly, my kind of raison d'etre for going to university for me was a very Sikh notion of standing up for the oppressed, the downtrodden, and giving a voice to those that didn't have a voice. But when I got to university, I realised there was a bigger battle uh, than I felt I could I could wage because in Scotland at that time, the twelve senior judges, eleven were men, and none of them were Catholic. So it felt to me like, would this change in my lifetime? And that's not to say I think you have more faith in me than my criminal law professor did when you say I would have made it to the Supreme Court. But if your path is blocked, you yourself, Keith, are such a kind of face and a name we're familiar with. People don't perhaps fully recognize the journey you went on to break through and get to the places you get to. We now take it for granted as we look and see MPs of color across all parties. But 
there were very few before you, if any. So I can ask you the same question. Did you feel your path would be cleared all the way? Did you feel you were hampered? <laughs> you know, listen, I'm not making any comparisons here, but you're certainly a better politician than, than the current Home Secretary. <laughs> would, you ever, would you have ever been given that position? You know, Now, look how clever he is, listeners. He's turned, he's turned this interview of me interviewing him <laughs> into an interview of me. There it goes. This is how clever Hardip Singh Kohli is. No, I'm not going to answer that question because we're no, going to no, take no, a course. break and we're going to come back and talk about your career in television and radio uh, where you've appeared on some of the biggest and most successful shows on television and radio. This is Keith Vaz talking to Hardip Singh Kohli, our glass ceiling breaker. We will be back after a short break. Keith Vaz on Talking Points. Like her. Welcome back. This is Keith Vaz on Like a Radio. I'm talking to Hardeep Singh Kohli, the broadcaster, comedian, writer, and indeed chef, our glass ceiling breaker of the week. Hardeep, unlike a lot of natural presenters, you started in direction and production on television, in children's TV, the series that uh, you were the director for, you directed Janet Street Porter's reportage and others. Why did you choose to go in that way rather than straightforward presenting? For me, there was no training in presenting. There was no learning in presenting. And what the BBC offered was a two-year deep dive education in how to make radio and television. And presenting seemed to me to be a skill that you either had or you didn't. It's difficult to train you to become a presenter. Sure, you can learn things on the way. And plus, to be honest with you, I didn't hold presenters in the highest regard. I thought they were kind of gobs on sticks, you know, muppets, as I used to call them. And when I became a presenter, I realized how right I was. I think it was the biggest <laughs> muppet of all. Um, no, so I mean, it was, you know, and I, and I really think, you know, my production background really informed on my presenting and continues to today. Mm. Now, you made that switch, having worked for the BBC, working for Auntie, the biggest brand name in television at that stage, of course, in the whole world. You went to do some independent work. Um, one of the highlights was your production of Meet the Lagoons in 2004, and then you started your love affair with food. The first series of MasterChef, followed by an appearance on Gordon Ramsay's Cook Along Live. First of all, why the switch, and then why food? Well, the switch for me was that the, the BBC is a bureaucratic organisation that actually, I don't think, I mean, if we look at the, the differential between women's pay and men's pay in the BBC, and if we look at the lack of working class representation in management of the BBC, the lack of people of colour in the BBC, um, mm. the lack of representation for Scotland in the BBC, you know, we pay 10% of the licence fee for Scotland, but receive 6% of the money spent. So it was never a place I, I felt was genuinely meritocratic. I mean, it is a certain aspect but not for me. So I thought if I went in the outside world, if I went to the free market, if you like, my skills would shine. And I was wrong, you know, because the industry, the industry, you know, it, was, it were tough times. You know, obviously I don't put that in the bio, but, you know, it was real hand to mouth for a number of years. That You know, the world wasn't really ready for a turban wearing Glaswegian seek making, presenting television and radio, you know. Mm. But your career took off. You did Sports Relief, Does the Apprentice, uh, Famous Rich and Homeless, The Right Stuff, The One Show, Celebrity Big Brother. Did these types of programmes, did you seek them or did they seek you? Well, I mean, I was never one to want to chase a career in that sense. I think the television is full of people who are, I know, you know, listen, how people choose to run their lives and their careers is their business. I'm not to judge, but for me, I felt it's that kind of the Kevin Costner thing of, you know, if you build it, they will come. If I show mm -hmm. that I am good, people will then come to me and want me to work. I didn't want to impose and foist myself upon productions. Some of those things I really want. I mean, I ne I've never done anything I didn't want to do, which is why perhaps there's some gap in my CV, you know, and some choices that people perhaps wouldn't fully appreciate or respect from the outside of the business. You know, I only did reality TV at the very end. It was the very last thing I did, you know, for very specific reasons, just to mm. reach a different audience. But, but, you know, the homeless program, you know, homelessness is something I've been uh, involved with since I was 15 years. Oh, they still cook twice a week for the homeless and we we'll cooking for the homeless at Christmas. I've done that for many Christmases in the last 15 years. It's been hugely important to me. So from that point of view, doing the homeless program was probably the most important thing I've done. And, the, the, mm. you know, I have to love everything else I do. And I'm not a rich man because I'm not interested in making money. I'm interested in communicating with an audience. My mum wishes I was a rich man. Mm. You've done radio and you've done TV and you've done live, as we will come on to when we talk about your career as a comedian. Did you actually expect the amazing 
critical reaction you had to the Great British Faith series that you did? People were really falling over themselves saying how good it was. Yeah, people were very kind. I mean, I think... For me, radio is my first love. It's what I was put on the planet to do. I, I was as blown away, I think, as, as everyone else was. I mean, we knew we were making something that came from a good place that was journalistically sort of sound. And, you know, I was really interested in the program and really interested in the people and the subject matter. But, I mean, it was I mean, it's massively humbling when you connect with an audience. You know, I think mm. in the kind of the paranormal glamour of kind of media, we forget the point of us is to connect with an audience audience and listenership and to tell them a story and have mm. to somehow improve the quality of their lives, whether it be through a bit of laughter, a bit of knowledge or a bit of connection. And what was I felt beautiful about that series, from my point of view, and I can't be objective, obviously I was involved in it, was that we showed our commonalities more than our differences. You know, we actually held hands rather than pointed fingers. When you analyze it anatomically, we are 95, 98% the same. But you would never think that reading the front page of any newspaper. And I think we managed mm. to create something of that through great British faith, you know? You certainly did. This is Keith Vaz on Like a Radio talking to the glass ceiling breaker, Hardeep Singh Kohli. We're going to be back to talk about his career in journalism and his career as a comedian. Join us after the break. The personalities that matter with Keith Vaz on Talking Points. Like a radio. Welcome back. This is Keith Vaz on Like a radio. Today, of course, is World Diabetes Day. So I hope everyone is being very careful about what they eat. Eat. I'm talking to the award-winning broadcaster, comedian, writer and chef, Hardeep Singh Kohli, our glass ceiling breaker. Uh, Hardeep Singh Kohli, you never gave up on journalism, even though you started as that BBC trainee. It was a course for television. You started writing a column for the biggest paper in Scotland, Hardeep Is Your Love. And you've written for numerous other publications, including GQ magazine, The Spectator and High Life. So as we're sitting there in uh, our seats on a British Airways uh, plane, we see an article by you. Of the three mediums, obviously, you've told us about television and radio you seem to like journalism you like writing don't you i do i think i come from that generation where we still used to write by hand in longhand i have journals i've just you know i've just had some decorating done on the flat and i was pulling stuff out the back of cupboards and i found my old diaries from when i was at university and god i loved writing i love the sound of my own voice probably still do <laughs> um and I think one writes differently when one's been kind of brought up in that tradition of writing. But again, for me, all my writing is about communicating with people and sharing stories. I mean, ultimately, people often say, you know, what do you do? You do all these different things. And actually, for me, they're not different, Keith. They're all the same. They're about storytelling, you know, because we were telling stories. You know, when the first two cave women were trying to invent the fire, they were probably telling each other stories to keep themselves distracted from the cold. So stories have existed before anything else. So for me, it's, it is our DNA. You know, connecting mm. is our DNA. You know, you know, you, you know, I know a lot. You know, we met. We haven't seen each other for a few years. We met last month, and again, it was just catching up stories. This, what you're doing, what you know. That's how we remember who we are. Mm. Now, you founded the Byline Festival, which was an independent festival. Obviously, we're going to talk about Edinburgh in a second. But sure. what was the purpose behind the establishment of Byline? Well, um, me and a, a couple of friends, Stephen Colgrave and Peter Jukes, felt that, I mean, this was, I mean, it was their vision as, as well as mine, for sure. I'd say more theirs than mine. They, they saw what was happening to the news. And the fact that 80% of our news media in the UK is controlled by, you know, a handful of octogenarian men who aren't even resident in the UK. They decide what fills our front pages. You know, everyone has their version of the truth, but an attack on facts. And what Byline stands for, and I'm incredibly proud of what the team uh, are continuing to achieve, going from strength to strength, are providing an accurate appraisal of what's going on in the world, an accurate appraisal of Brexit, of, of mm. COVID. And can you believe what's happening with our government today? And are the papers really holding Boris Johnson to account? I mean, if it was, you know, Jeremy Corbyn got slung over the coals for simply existing. And Boris Johnson is doing all these things and nobody seems to want to hold him to account. So that's what we're trying to achieve at Byline. And you know, we had two really successful festivals. Obviously, we had to cancel the last one through mm. COVID. But, you know, um, the online side of Byline Times, Byline Television, that's growing from strength 
strength, some incredible people involved with that, some incredible journalists and writers and an investigative team, the like of which, you know, hasn't been seen for, for decades in Fleet Street. You know, so mm. it's truth. That's what it's about. Give the populace the truth. Let them decide what to do with it. Don't let's make those decisions for people. Mm. Now, it was in Edinburgh, not Glasgow, that you performed your first one-man show that really launched you in comedy, The Nearly Naked Chef, the yeah. first live curry cooking comedy show ever. I'm trying to imagine what this was like. Was it really nerve-wracking getting out there? Was it Archie Archie Rice and the Entertainer going out there and facing this audience? What was it like when you did it for the first time? I mean, I'm always going to be aware of the fact that whatever I do professionally in my career, it's not nearly as important as what a nurse does, what a teacher does, mm. what, you know, a vet does, you know, well, you know, I mean, we haven't had our bins emptied in Glasgow for 10 days because of a strike. I mean, my job isn't nearly as important as emptying the bins. So from that point of view, you know, one has to put oneself into perspective. What's the worst thing that happens if my job doesn't go well? I get some silence, you know, everyone still is alive at the end of the show. So from that point of view, I just feel very lucky to do what I do. And I feel it's incredibly, you know yourself, when you stand up and speak, as you have done, not just in Parliament, but everywhere, but there is a, a real energy of, of communication, a, kind of, a crackling electricity of connection. And I love that. In your comedy, what's what I like about your comedy is you never denigrate your own community. Obviously, you make fun of situations, but you never denigrate it. You never attack the community as others do. Is that a conscious decision that you're taking? Because people sometimes expect ethnic minority comedians to do this, but you seem to have crossed the divide. I just, again, I think we are defined by what we have in common. But in comedy, it's, it's our differences that are really interesting. But you have to, you have to love what you do. And I think there's enough negativity. I am really not one of those people that wants to be nasty for the sake of being nasty. I don't find that funny. There are comedians, quite a few of them on the circuit, that just think being rude is the way forward. If you're going to laugh at yourself, you need first to hear me laugh at myself. Mm. You know, so that I'm, you know, and you know, if I'm a, if I'm a satirist, I have to be punching up and not punching down. The minute you put a microphone and amplification around me. It gives me an improved status, so it's not fair to kind of hit down at people in, in that scenario. Plus, you know, if everyone reacted as sweetly as you react to my, you know, comedy, then hopefully the world would be a slightly better place. <laughs> but it's only it's only really about a learning to laugh. If we can acknowledge our differences and laugh at them, what mm. massive strength that gives us, you know. Mm. This is Keith Ayres on Like a Radio. I am talking to the broadcaster, comedian, writer and chef Hardeep Singh Kohli, our glass ceiling breaker. When we come back, we're going to be talking to him a bit about politics, the SNP and how he's recovered from COVID, which he had very recently. Join us after the break. Talking Points with Keith Vaz, celebrating diversity. Like a London. The time when you were on a diet, but the kheer was served, so you had to try it. And you licked the spoon too after the last bite. That's why we do it. When your wife and you had a fight, and you made prawn rice that night, did she just say, sorry honey, you were right? That's why we do it. Every time you take the first bite of pulao, biryani or jeera rice, you can't help but shut your eyes. And that's why we do it. Elevate your feasts with Tilda this festive season. Ali Bhavan, a new supermarket hai. 11 to 15 marketplace Bexley Heath. Mein. Car park free hogi, agar minimum spending 20 pound hogi. Ali Bhavan ke piche customer collection ki entrance Arnsburg Way ke dwara hai. Siyada jankari ke liye alibhavan.com visit ki jiye. Special festive offers ke liye Ali Bhavan mein aapka swagat hai. Get ready. Atif Aslam is back. Atif Aslam live on Saturday, the 12th of February at the Exile Auditorium, London. Tickets on sale now at brightbeat.co.uk and Vidyarama on 0208 907 0116. Book now to avoid disappointment. If someone has COVID-19 in your workplace, they breathe it out in particles. Particles that linger in the air like smoke and could be breathed in by other employees and customers. Keeping workspaces well ventilated helps disperse these particles. So open windows and doors regularly. Check mechanical ventilation is providing enough fresh air and consider using a CO2 monitor to help keep the air safe. Stop COVID-19 hanging around. Find out more at gov.uk slash working safely. This is BIP. Completely cardless credit. Card free, fee free. One interest rate. Just set up and go. All in one day. 
Spend it and cap it. Do it your way. This is credit in an app. Control in your hand. Life run by you. BIP. Cardless credit you control. Download the app today. Search BIP credit. Representative 29.9% APR variable. Credit issued by New Day Limited. 18 plus subject to status. Terms apply. Are you selling goods on eBay or Amazon? Then you need sellershub.io. Visit sellershub.io today and book your demo. Strings Entertainment brings you the Pakistani sensation Aima Beg and Farhan Saeed in London with the Leo Twins on Sunday the 12th of December at the Indigo O2. Book now on stringsentertainment.co.uk. A radio partner like a radio. This is Keith Az on Like a Radio. I am talking to the broadcaster, comedian, writer and chef, Hardeep Singh Kohli, our glass ceiling breaker. This interview could go on forever because it's so fascinating to see what he's done in his journey through life. Hardeep Singh Kohli, you're in Glasgow. This is where the whole world has gone to. The bins may not be emptied, but <laughs> President Biden was there along with Nancy Pelosi and Boris Johnson and everyone else. Are you with the governments of the world? i.e. Biden, Johnson, Merkel, or are you with Greta Thunberg? Is it all blah, blah, blah? I mean, I'm somewhere in the middle. I suppose I've, I, I, can, I grew up a Marxist, so I'm, I'm bound to go for the synthesis <laughs> of it all. I, I think that putting to one side the, the arrant hypocrisies of private jets from Boris Johnson mm. to come up to a climate conference. I think it has, this has to happen at a governmental level and a supranational level. It has to, you know, uh, climate change does not distinguish borders. It, it, it simply doesn't. So we need to work together. It has been a shame that, you know, uh, President Xi hasn't been there. But there again, there's been a strong enough Chinese delegation. Mm. I think we can be a great deal bolder than we choose to be. I think the, you know, when, when you and I were kids, we would never have imagined the oil lobby, you know, the petroleum lobby, having their grip mm. loosened on car technology, on the automotive industry. But that's the biggest growth, you know, 10% growth year on year. You know, in the past, you know, Sinclair recently, you know, who innovated in a sense, you know, kind of electric vehicles, you know, at one level. But we can be more dramatic about change because we have to be. And the thing is, you know, in Scotland, the reason the conference is here is partly because we are a world leader in renewable and sustainable energy. You know, we can light up North Europe mm. if we simply invested more. And that's part of the reason I want independence because I want my government in my country to make choices for my people, you know, mm. and, and for not to be political with a capital P, but political for the people. Mm. As you say, you want independence. You're a Scot through and through. You join the SNP and you really believe that Scotland should be independent. Have you changed your mind at all uh, since you joined the SNP or are you more fervently for independence? I've never been more passionate about independence, but it's an argument that's often misconstrued by the by the outsider. So here's a fact. The day after independence, I would sit on the benches next to you more than some members that were in the SNP. Mm. The SNP is a means to an end. As a means to creating, restoring the independent nation of Scotland. The minute that happens, you know, I revert to my socialist sisters and brothers. I revert to, you know, what I believe to be, because the SNP, there isn't a clear mandate of the party. I mean, it's astonishing the SNP have achieved what they've achieved, but, you know, it isn't, it's a single issue party that's in government and it's done a pretty good job. But, you know, we're centre-left because the leader is centre-left. If we've got a centre-right leader, that's what we would be. And the party shouldn't be led by the leader. It should be led by the electorate. There was a point, we lost the referendum in 14 because of economics. Then I saw what happened with the Syrian refugees who were coming into the country and the reaction of the press and the reaction of a lot of the English public towards them. And that then became a moral position for me. Hmm. I, don't, I don't care about how much money I have in the bank. I'm not going to turn away refugees of a war that we stood by and did nothing to stop hmm. happening. You know, I would rather die on my feet than live on my knees. You know, and the irony of all ironies is the Syrian people, the reason they have such a rich culture and such a rich country and tradition is because they opened their doors to every immigrant, every refugee in the Middle East went to Syria, creating this amazing country. Mm. And now, we're, you know, we're going to stop people. You know, ask yourself this, under Theresa May's government, would we have allowed children to come in from Nazi Germany? Probably not. Throughout your entire career, you have been passionate about the causes that you believe in. But you must have faced some element of racism in journalism 
journalism and broadcasting. It never seems to have held you back and you never seem to talk about it. But have you experienced that in the profession yeah, that you're in? A lot. You know, you need to bear in mind when you and I were coming through, it was a different age. There was no Citizen Khan on television. There was no mm. Anita Rani on BBC One. There was an absence of it. Was, at those times, of course, you know, there was there continues to be racism. The way the press treat you is racist. You know, you and I have both been badly treated by the press, and it's interesting. When we look around at our colleagues and our contemporaries and other people who have behaved worse than us, don't seem to get the same treatment we get. Sure, I've, you know, maybe I've achieved a lot. I've done some great work. But could I have done more work? Should, you know, I was able to do more work. And the reason I don't talk about it is because it needs to change systemically. I don't want to be defined by my ethnicity. My ethnicity is mm. a very important part of who I am, but mm. it's not by any means. Right? Listen, I remember when you first got elected, we were astonished. Like, how can somebody brown be called Keith? And then <laughs> mom and dad explained to us, I mean, that there are Christians in India, there are more Christians than Sikhs in India. I'm like, all oh, right, okay, fine. You know, but still, so why call him Keith? You know, go for Sebastian. You know, go for Nicholson. Go for something, you know, dramatic. Keith, it's fine. We'll accept it. It's not a bad score of Scrabble. So yeah, I mean, but there again, you know, we we aren't 5% of the population. Look at the way women are treated in the media. 51% of the population. Mm. So, you know, women still are paid 14 pence in the pound less than men across the board. You know, if you're a woman, you're 38% likely to be killed by a partner or ex-partner as opposed to 6% of men. If we're mm. not doing anything for 51% of the population, why would we do anything for 5% of the population? You know, so we need to make sure we, we win the big battles. Indeed. Now, it's nearly 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. Let's cheer everyone up. You are the biggest name in Asian comedy on television and radio. So make like a laugh. Tell us a joke before you go. Okay. So two Punjabi mothers at a wedding and one says to the other one, oh, Panji, the food at this wedding is terrible. And the other one says, I know, Panji, and the portions are so small. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure, I'm sure the next Punjabi wedding that you're invited to, they're going to make sure that the portions <laughs> are going to be very big. Yeah. Sinkoli, you have lit up Canary Wharf with your answers today. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you for doing what you are doing and breaking the glass ceiling every single day. Now, we always ask our special guests to choose a song that means something special to them and to dedicate it to someone special. Which song would you like to choose and who is it dedicated to? Well, actually, um, we're not that far from Christmas, I suppose. There's 35, 36 shopping days or whatever. Mm. And I thought I'd dedicate this to people who are not with the people they wish to be with over the holidays. It's a song by Nitin Sawney, who's an absolute legend and an incredible ah. creative mm. musician and everything. He's an amazing man. And it's a song called Nadia from his second album, Beyond Skin. Let us hear Hardy Coley's song. Hardy, thank you again for joining us. My pleasure. Before I go, Keith, let me just say one thing. Talk about glass ceiling breakers. I don't know how many of us would be where we are today without people like you, specifically you, breaking those ceilings for us. Oh, that is so, so sweet. Thank you. Take care, Keith. Let me um, wish uh, everyone uh, that listens to Like Radio the very best through um, the next few weeks. Uh, and remember, uh, there's an open jumpy phrase, a friend is just a stranger you haven't borrowed money from yet. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear his song.